Okay. So let's talk about chapter one, the nature of international law. I hope that for purposes of our preliminary examination, we'll be able to finish at least four chapters uh, from the book of Father Joaquin Bernas. Okay, so let's define uh, what's the concept of international law. Okay, by traditional definition, the international law refers to the body of rules and principles of action binding upon civilized states in the relation to one another. So as I've said, no one um, no one can survive in isolation. So for instance, if you are a member of the international community, you are bound to follow the international principles, the international ideas, and the international customs or rules agreed upon by states. So always remember the principle of auto-limitation that once you become a member in the international community and you are a signatory to any convention, to any protocol, or to any um, treaty or agreement, executive agreement, you are partly okay, uh, surrendering your sovereignty uh, to the international community, to the jurisdiction of that particular organization um, in that sense. Okay. So what are the entities governed under international law? It is uh, primarily gov governs the, the states, international organizations, and individuals. So who are these? These are, these are actors in the international community. We, we, when we say states, uh, of course, you, you need to remember the four elements of state, the people, their, their government, and sovereignty. When we talk about international organization, Okay. These are entities okay, agreed upon in order, in, agreed upon by the states or the member states thereof in order to, to achieve a certain purpose. So um, in our study of international re and regional organizations, uh, you will take that when you reach fourth tier, um, we will know that there is classification as to international organization whether its purpose is specific centered or it has a specific purpose or it has a general purpose okay so for instance in the case of united nation we can say that it has um, a general purpose whereas um, in the case of apec for example which is uh, also an uh, institution an organization we know that the, the 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 basic purpose of apec is more focus on the economic aspect in the international community okay and of course we have individuals right so the restatement of foreign relations law of the united states considered by u.s courts the most authority authoritative work on international law so the law which deals with the conduct of states and of international organizations and with their relations inter se as well with some of their relations with persons, whether natural or juridical. So international law is important because, as we learned from history, we had uh, several wars. We had, of course, we have World War One, World War Two, Cold War, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although Cold War has uh, no really casualty at all, but the first two World Wars has been um, drastic to the economic aspect and political aspect. In fact, it created political turmoil and economic turmoil to uh, those who were affected in those warfare. So um, laws are important. International law is important because it will serve as a guiding principle of states in order to prevent these kinds of um, scenario or in order to prevent this kind of conflict. Okay, so as much as possible, we always adhere to the principle of interdependence. And what is that interdependence? That, that states should cooperate from one another, should help one another in order to um, prevent this type of conflict. Because in, as we all know, in warfare, there is no really victorious party. So again, this international will serve as a conduct of states and of international organizations. And because of the rise of treaties, the rise of um, agreements, okay? So this is one way of protecting our sovereignty, protecting the international community from being devastated again because of warfare. Okay, so what's the scope of international law? In the age of technological advancement and globalization, public international law is rapidly expanding that means new subject matters, changing political and social principles, and new states and entities being added 
to the community of nations. Beyond the primary concern for the maintenance of peace, it, it extends to cover all the interests of international and even domestic life. So as we all know, um, this is uh, wholesome in nature in a sense that it covers almost all, all aspects of life, be it sociologically speaking, economically speaking, um, politically speaking, and in terms of military armaments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all covered under international law, and international law has something to do with this. For example, the the prohibition of the use of nuclear weapons. Okay, so that is a very well known principle in international law, which needs to be followed, which needs to be adhered upon by the members of the international community. Another thing is. Um, the principle of non-intervention. Okay, so these are considered to be uh, well-known principles in international, in the sense that even if you're not a member to an organization or any institution in the in the global community, still you are required to follow those things. Okay, so we'll we'll know about it um, in detail uh, as we reach that part. Okay, so of course when we talk about international law, there's always this controversy or this question whether do we consider international law as a law okay so the the following reasons illustrate the arguments why pil or international law is not law and why it's commonly disregarded first there can be no law binding sovereign sovereign states so as we all know we have the concept of the principle of sovereignty okay when we say sovereignty it's the um the the ultimate power of the state to govern its own people okay in fact we have two types of sovereignty we have external sovereignty and internal sovereignty meaning um other states no matter how stable they are economically and politically speaking they cannot really intervene okay with the affairs of the state because your interest should be addressed upon by the government of that country or by the government of that state okay Nothing more, nothing less. You know, in other words, you cannot okay, in any way intervene with those matters which are uh, which involves domestic interest. Second argument, no international legislative body. So there's really no legislative body, unlike in, for instance, in, in national sphere where you have the justice department which creates law. In international law, there is no specific legislative body where uh people get to meet to each other ambassadors get to meet to each other and then they will decide on a particular legislation and then they will they are going to implement it okay so there is no such thing as legislative institution in the international law the united nations general assembly resolutions are generally not binding on anybody yes in general assembly as you learn later on um this only the organ in the united nations in which all the members of all the members of the organization have the right to say, have the right to speak, discuss, and vote on a certain decision of the organization. However, these resolutions do not have binding effect because, uh, in fact, these resolutions has to undergo okay, the screening or perhaps um, the, the approval of the Security Council, which is the most potent organ in the United Nations, before it can be um, implemented or it can be issued on behalf of the United Nations. Another thing, no international executive to enforce legislation. Of course, as we all know, when you, may, when you make a law, when you create a law, there has to be execution, okay, in order for that law, okay, to have a, a force, a binding force, or to have its effect or teeth, kumbaga, no? So, dapat na ang balao. That's, that's how we conceptualize law, right? So, in the case of international law, there's no executive department, executive institution, which has the duty of enforcing the legislation made by the General, General Assembly. Okay. UN Security Council intended to be an international executive, always prevented by veto power and no assured procedure of identifying violation. Most of UN powers have reference to law breaking taking the form of an act of aggression or a threat to peace. But there are many violations of PIL which are not of this nature. As a result, all the UN can do is censure. Okay, so um, later on, we will know that United Nations, uh, United Nations Security Council is the most powerful um, organ in the United Nations. Okay, so the United Security Council 
the UN Security Council rather is composed of five permanent mem members and the other um, non-permanent members. Okay, the non-permanent members can be replaced okay, by the majority vote of the the General Assembly, while the other five permanent members cannot be replaced because they are known to be the big five in the unit in the United Nations um, Security Council, and only um, these five countries are, are are given the right of right to veto um, policies or issuances in the United Nations. Other than the, uh, the members or the ordinary members in the United Nations do not have such power. Okay. Another um, argument that it's that international law is not a law. There's no central authority to make judgments binding on states. So as we all know, in a national sphere, for instance, okay, if you violated the law, uh, let's say for example, there's a legislation, okay, so there's a prohibition, for example, um, cybercrime law, okay, there's a violation of cybercrime law, ginawa ng legislative department, tapos may si Mr. A, nakaviolate niya, nakaviolate sa um, cybercrime law, and again, um, after it is being executed, by the police or by the law enforcement authority of the Philippines, it that that person, that accused, will be placed uh, in a court proceedings to have due process. Okay, and in this case, there is no central authority that will have the power to to judge on a certain case or controversy. Okay, um, although we have international court of justice, we have uh, international criminal court, but again, um, these. Uh, except well for except for for ICC which which can really you know um, enforce its judgment and you, it can really imprison you but um, I think there are only uh, two cases or one case one or two cases decided successfully by the ICC but the ICJ on the other hand although it's a court and it's part of the 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 United Nations it's an organ of the United Nations but again it has no um, enforcement uh, power in, in the sense that it can really subject the state to a certain punishment or penalty and whatnot. Okay. Another argument is that national policy or interest is often preferred over international law. Okay. Uh, that's basic uh, principle in international law that in case of conflict class, okay, always the domestic law will prevail. Okay. So let's talk about the death penalty, for instance. Death penalty for, uh, in the Philippines. As we all know, is suspended. Okay, we have suspended international law pursuant to our commitment in the international law, particularly the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which also prohibits um, death penalty. So, because of that, because of our obedience and commitment to the international um, ideas and principles, we have suspended our own death penalty in the Philippines. But again, uh, under the Constitution, it is merely suspended at and. Um, any time of the day, it can be reinstated. It can be reimposed by the senators or the lawmaking uh, body. And again, so you might be asking, sir, if we um, reimpose the death penalty, will it not contravene to our commitment in the international relation in the international law? But again, the answer to that question is simple. Between international law and between domestic law, which merely suspends death penalty. Which law will prevail? Of course, it's the doc, it's the, the the domestic law or the Philippine law will prevail over international law. Okay, I hope you get that. Above arguments are based on an exaggerated notion of sovereignty as Im embodying an individualist regime, but this is not the reality. Reality is social interdependence and the predominance of the general interest. So the submission of father Bernas is that um, international law is a law simply because it is recognized as such by the members of the international community or the global community. Okay, so we don't need to exaggerate the concept of sovereignty. No, okay, it doesn't mean that uh, there's an inter international law being followed by states. It doesn't necessarily follow and logic logically follow that we are already surrendering our every so so sovereignty every cent of our sovereignty to the international community or organization of which uh, we're a member, okay? 
So simple as that, no? It it's considered a law because it's being considered as such by the the members of the international community by states itself. Okay. So according to Henkin, almost all nations observe almost all principles of international law and almost all of their obligations almost all of the time. Okay. So this uh the argument in the contrary. According also to Briar Lee, law is binding because a reasonable man, whether as an individual or as part of a state, believes that order is preferred over chaos and that order is the governing principle of the world. So by, by committing ourselves, no, by committing themselves to the international customs and principles, okay, we are likewise adhering to the to the policy of the international community for the prevention of any conflict or any warfare that may occur because of our differences. Because um, inherently speaking, you now we have diverse culture, we have diverse tradition, we have diverse laws for of course, no, but it's a natural consequence that 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 conflict may arise, that that warfare may arise, okay, because there might be a failure of politics, failure of so and so. And because of that, there has to be something, there has to be a certain uh, guiding principle or conduct for the state to follow in order to prevent these kinds of situation or this kind of um, unfortunate okay, um, conflict. So on a final analysis, on a final note, there is a general fundamental respect for law because of the possible consequences of defiance either to oneself or to the larger society. International law is law because it is seen as such by states and other subjects of international law. It's true, okay? If you violated something under international law, you cannot be imprisoned. You cannot imprison the state, you know, in how we, we appreciate penalty in a national sphere. Because in, in a national sphere, once you are convicted of any crime, then you can, you'll be imprisoned, right? Okay. But in international, there is no such thing as that. No, what only, um, what's the the adverse, you know, effect or outcome if you violate international law is that it will destroy the reputation of the state. Okay, if for example you have been um, non-compliant and you have been disobedient to the, to your commitments under international, do you think other states would want would be inclined in talking to you in entering into agreements or treaties with you? Not at all. Okay, because you already have destroyed your image in the global community or in the international community. Okay. So let's talk about theories in international law. We have discussed this already. We have command theory from John Austin. Um, law consists of two months originating from a sovereign and backed up by threats of sanction if disobeyed. In this view, international law is not law because there is no command sovereign. So there's really no commanding system or commanding institution which let's say now direct every state to you know okay philippines follow this and that uh, china follow this and that do not um attack the the fishermen of the philippines do not attack any vietnamese fishermen in the in this area okay in this easy in this easy no? there is no commanding institution in their international law which could uh you know reprimand the the actions of every state another theory that we need to remember is consensual international law is binding because of the consent of the states like treaties and customary law so consensual theory is um also applicable in the present time or in reality because consent really is material insofar as the implementation of the international law or the the enforcement so to speak of international law okay in fact, um, when we uh, enforce okay, international principles and ideas, it has to be with consent of that particular um, state we are reprimanding or the state which is the subject of any controversy or um, judgment. In the case of, for instance, in the case of International Criminal Court, after the preliminary investigation, and when there is probable cause, then um, it can be followed by the issuance of the warrant of arrest to that person who committed um, a crime under ICC, like for instance, genocide, um, crime against humanity, etc., etc. So 
In that case, consent is material because the ICC will ask okay, the consensus of that state okay, of which that accused is currently residing. Okay, so however, there are many binding rules which do not derive from consent. But, but in general, um, we we live by the consent and we give spirit okay, to the international law on the basis of the consent of those who are subject or those who have been subjected um, by by international principle and international custom. Okay. Um, what's the other theory? We have the natural law theory. Uh, it's the law. The law is derived by reason from the nature of man. International law is the application of natural reason to the nature of the state person. So the theory finds little support, but much of customary law and what are regarded as general principles of international law are expressions of natural law. So um, again, the dissenters are... Um, has no objective basis for international law because it is a mere combination of politics, morality, and self-interest hidden under the smoke screen of um, legal language. But after all, it's all about politics. Okay, It's all about self-interest. Yes, you might talk about cooperation, you might talk about interdependence and whatnot, but after all, at the end of the day, this hegemon, no, sabi ng mga dissenters, this hegemon will always work for the best interest of their nation. And it will never work for the benefit of their neighboring state or who, uh, whoever is their uh, considered friend, quote unquote, in the global community. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between public versus private international law. What is what are the scope and differences between the two? When we talk about public international law or PIL, it governs the relationship between and among states and also their relations with international organizations and um, individual persons. So, for instance, there's a conflict between Uganda and Rwanda, or uh, let's say um, Belgium versus um, Uganda. Okay. So what law will you apply? Of course, you cannot apply private international law. You apply public international law because it's a conflict between state to state, meaning state versus state, and there's a conflict as to the relationship of these two nations. Okay. Another thing, or another example is the conflict between the um, Philippine government and China over the West Philippine Sea, although it was submitted before the arbitration court. No? So what do you apply in that case? Public international law, okay? particularly the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. But UNCLOS is considered as a public international because it is a rule of conduct. Okay, it's a law okay, between and among nations insofar as the 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 uh, maritime territories are concerned. Okay, how about private international law? Okay, also known as conflicts of law. It's really considered domestic law, which deals with cases where foreign law intrudes in the domestic sphere, where there are questions of the applicability of foreign law or the role of foreign courts. So basically private international law are different from is different from PIL because in private international law it will only apply if the controversy has something to do with with the conflict of individuals meaning for example if a filipina married is married to um a, po, a polish a okay, polish okay sa sa europe no magkasawa sila okay and then there in in Poland, okay, they have secured both of them. They have secured uh, because of the cloud of their marriage. They have secured a divorce decree, okay, in Poland, which is recognized and valid in Poland. Okay, the question there is: is that divorce? No, is the divorce decree, divorce decision, um, by the court of justice in Poland, be recognized in the Philippine law? Okay, so these are the types of cases that we need to um, understand and we need to look into when we talk about private international law. Another thing, okay, you went to US and then you have properties in the Philippines. You execute a uh, oh, wills, will and testament. So, um, in that case, what will what law will you apply then? No, okay. So in that case, you apply the civil code. Okay. Or 
Um, and what does the civil code say says about uh, about these um, cases or about this scenario when you are, for example, a Filipino citizen living or residing in the U.S. and you have left you know, several properties in the Philippines. So in that case, since it talks about domestic law, which deals cases with uh, cases of individuals, then you apply private international law. Okay. So um, let's also talk about the historical development of international law. You can find this uh, all information in your book. Uh, during the ancient international law, govern exchange of diplomatic emissary, emissaries, peace treaties, the progressive rules of just use gentium or law common to all men became the law of the Roman Empire. So um, it started during the um, ancient times and even during the medieval period where uh, the creation uh, of empires has been prevalent. Okay. The modern international law began with the birth of nation states in the medieval, medieval age. It was governed by Roman or canon law, which drew heavily from natural law. Uh, Grotius, the father of modern international law, authored the Iori Belli Akpasis, which discussed the law of nations. And of course, it was later named um, international law by British philosopher Jeremy Bentham. He was preceded by largely natural law theorists. Positivist approach reinterpreted international law on the basis of what actually happened in the conflict between states and not from concepts derived from prison. So the notion of sovereignty gave rise to the Austin's command theory. And after that, okay, Pacta Sunt Servanda arose in light of the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the 30 years war from 1618 to 1648 um, and established a treaty-based framework for peace cooperation. So during this time, um, we were um, under the colony of the Spanish government. Um, in 1815, the Congress of Vienna ended the Napoleonic Wars and created a sophisticated system of multilateral political and economic cooperation. So this um, talks about uh, nothing much there. No? It's talk about the history of international. You can actually uh, read them on your own um, based on the materials I gave you. So after that, no, uh, because of the World War, the First World War, they have signed the Treaty of uh, Versailles no, or the League of Nations and it arose after the culmination of the First World War. So nahuman ang World War, nahuman ang guerra. Okay. Katong 30 years, 30 years war pa no, from 16 18. Then they have signed what the Treaty of Westphalia to in an attempt you not know, to prevent another warfare. Okay, that's why they have created the League of Nations following the 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 their affirmation to the Treaty of Versailles. So after it's just a World War One, as an institution set up by the victors of the war to prevent the recurrence of world um conflagration. But um of course no, uh, it's very ironic that uh, the 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 United States government didn't even ratify the League of Nations. That's why it was too weak to be to be destroyed. And in fact, it was not really successful at all in preventing the 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 another um, world war, which is the World War Two, no? Because that's really the purpose of the League of Nations. Na dapat wala na guerra, di na magkagera, no? Because nga um, they have created this organization, this institution, para magsabot sabot tanga kung da wala na guerra sa sunod. Okay, so here the United States did not join the League of Nations created the par permanent court of international justice, so PCIJ. Okay, ito yung um, predecessor ni um, International Court of Justice. But remember, no, we do not have PCIJ in the present. No, gipulihan na siya ni International Court of Justice. Okay, so what are the cases catered under the International Court of Justice? Um, usually. Not usually, but cases in the International Court of Justice deals with uh, maritime dispute, maritime conflicts, and state-to-state -state, um, controversy or state-to-state -state issue. But uh, in the case of ICC, mga ilang basic difference, ICC caters cases which involves no violation of crime by an individual. So they prosecute individuals while in ICJ, the subject or the parties thereof are states necessarily 
Islamic states. Okay. So after the First World War, the establishment of the United the League of Nations failed to prevent the Second World War. Uh, the victors then set up the UN in 1945 as a new avenue for peace. This marked a shift of power away from Europe, the beginning of a truly in universal institution. Um, it also uh, talks about the decolonization. The universalization began by the establishment of the UN was advanced by decolonization, resulting in an expansion of membership in the UN, composing of formerly colonists now newly recognized. So during this time, we were under the occupation. Okay. Um, it's an occupation, not colonization. Occupation under Japanese government following the occupation also of the American government sometime in 1940s. Okay. So the grouping of states during the Cold War, the Western socialist de developing countries, the Western states, uh, US, etc., were not of one mind, but insisted on two general points. That legal provisions must be clear and precise and that any substantive rule must be accompanied by an implementation mechanism that can spot and correct violations. So um, during this time, again, the states have realized na, oy, kanang, wala jay maayong na dulot ang gera. No? Wala jay, di, di jay siya advantageous at all sa kinabuhi sa isa ka estado no? wala yun siya na produce uh, any good no except for those uh, victors siguro who successfully won um, that warfare okay so um, here they they exerted efforts in order to really um, strengthen their their the the collective effort of the victors of the previous war and then they have developed um, an institution where it would prevent the occurrence of the Third World War. Okay. Um, some reminded satisfied with the status quo, but some were more open to Third World demands and were supportive of social and legal changes. So, as we can observe, if you study your your book, okay, if you study the the the, the notes I gave you. Okay, the, the very purpose or the very reason of why we had war, the Second World War particularly, and even after the World War, uh, the was Cold War, right? So the very reason why it, it um, they arrived into that type of situation, right? that type of conflict, it's because of the differences with their ideologies. No? Um, ideology in running the government, in running the state. Okay, so they espouse a different system of government, uh, different economic system, and so on and so forth. Because of that, there's conflict, and with conflict, um, they usually uh, engage into warfare. Okay, and that's the basic reason, or or the the reason, the very reason why there's conflict, why there's war. Okay. Um. As to grouping of states during the Cold War, the socialist states were led by the Soviet Union, which sought to avert Western intrusion in domestic affairs, even as they sought relatively good relations with the West for the sake of economic and commercial interchange. They also sought to convert developing nations to their ideology. So again, because of differences of ideology, they're trying to you know, convince other states to, okay, come on, join us you know, so that we can be allies. We can uh, agree. Um, to, to some international policies or national policies policies so that it would of course contribute to our respective um, citizens right so that's a problem during that um, during that time of course uh, who will rule again the world are those victors in the warfare because they need the oak see they are like uh, they like be ruling the, the world again. So developing countries formed the overwhelming majority and were mostly firmer colonies suffering under development with newly industrializing countries like Philippines and Malaysia. Thailand, Singapore, and South Korea who earned their independence through armed or political struggle were remaining under the influence of Western or socialist ideas. So it's very um, you know, um, ironic to think that the Philippines is one of the, the those um, nations or states in the in the in Asia uh, who obtained 
its independence. But uh, look at the Philippines now. No? It's one of the uh, slowest um, economy in the region. Okay, so kita may pinaka dugay po the develop. Okay, as a nation, as a state, although we were one of those, uh, the one of the 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 first states who have acquired um, independence from the control of the foreign um, entities and foreign states. Okay, so the dissolution of the Soviet Union led the reemergence of international relations being based on multiple sources of power and not an ideology. So there were several attempts to live in a communal way or to follow the communism, the idea of communism. But again, um, time and time again, they have not been successful in implementing, if that's the proper word, or in applying okay, that uh, political or economic system in their, um, in their country. The Baltic states, known as the Estonia, Latvia, and Ukraine, were restored to statehood and the newly born Russian Federation did not inherit the Soviet Union's position as superpower. So uh, let me ask you, what's the what organ in the United Nations which is tasked okay, to restore or to, to somehow to check or perhaps to determine the status of statehood of a particular entity. Now, it's the trusteeship council. If the trusteeship council thinks, although it hasn't been um, active for how, for several years now, no? but the very purpose for, for academic um, discussion only, the very purpose of trusteeship council is to determine whether you are already, re uh, already prepared and you are ready to to govern your own state, to govern your own government, to have your own government. If not, then you'll be un placed under the, the supervision of the Trusteeship Council. Okay. So the last remaining superpower politically and ideologically leading the Western states, it acts as both world politician in a selective manner and global mediator. As we all know, no, in the fourth revolution, industrial revolution which is today, you know, is the, the, the present time, present moment, um, the world has been dominated by the Chinese government and the US government. They were the leading um, exports, economically speaking, and they are, of course, one, um, they have the best or the, the, the most stable um, armaments and uh, military equipments compared to, to other nations or to other states. Socialist countries are no longer united. Some depend on support from Western states. And that's the, the, the fall or the failure of uh, socialism. Developing countries have veered away from ideological orientation and towards market orientation, as well as fighting poverty and backwardness. So that's why they have created the United Nations, uh, created the 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 banking institutions like the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. So the, the very purpose of these institutions, banking institutions really is to assist economically those states, especially those who have suffered so much by the effects of the Second World War. And of course, those who were left behind by the control of the Western states and they have to restart on their own. That's why they need to recover on their own. So these financial institutions were there, were created in order to assist and to help these nations. The UN has declined as the international agency for the maintenance of um, peace. Okay, so that concludes um, chapter one of the book.